This podcast is brought to you by the Islamic Center at NYU. For more information, visit our website at www.icnyu.org. Rahman Rahim, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah, ala alihi wa sahbatihi wa man wala assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Inshallah, we're going to continue reading from where we stopped last week. Um, we'll read a little bit shorter today. Uh, inshallah, next week, hopefully, we can continue uh, with our previous level of strength and capacity, inshallah. Imam Al Ghazali was talking about the third enemy, which is going to present itself at the moment we try to begin a life of faith and devotion, and that is shaitan. So, for those of you who haven't attended before, I would encourage you to watch the previous recordings because I'm sure a lot of information was covered there. Before we get started, though, it's also important to realize he doesn't really address it here. Uh, he alludes to it is that one of the areas that shaitan really tries to uh, misguide the Muslims is through ta'wil and nusus, how they understand and interpret texts. The word ta'wil is from the same word as awwal, the first, because when you awwal, you return, you try to return to the original intent of the meaning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا يَعْلَمُ تَأْوِيلَهُ إِلَّا اللَّهِ In the Qur'an, ta'wil. And Imam As-Suki and Al-Jam'a Jawami, which is a very important book in the philosophy of Islamic law, he has a section on, on interpretation, textual interpretation, because in America, we don't have very many people who are fluent in English and then fluent in usul fiqh. That's just a reality. So the masses and even, I would say, the larger periphery of religious educators are not educated in a way that will allow them to conclude correct ta'wil on many issues. And that's why we see one of the challenges within the North American community is the absence of, of scholarly centering which now is left open to different irresponsible forms of interpretation. Speaking specifically now to North America, not Canada or the UK or other places, every place has its own issues. So we see then people who, when they don't have the prerequisite knowledge for interpretation, then they're going to insert whatever they have, whether it's nostalgia. So one of the benchmarks of the American Muslim community, whether convert, second, third generation, or from overseas even, is that nostalgia becomes a source of interpretation. But nostalgia is not considered a recognized source of interpretation in Islamic law. Romanticized history. And we want to interrogate ideas. And we're not interrogating ideas to destroy one another, but to defend our religion. Right? And to make sure that we we're careful of this plot of shaitan, the first trick of shaitan with our, our parents was that of ta'wil. He interpreted the command not to eat from the tree in a way that he said to them, The only reason that your Lord has prohibited you from eating this tree is that you will live forever or become angelic, an angel. That's ta'wil, ta'wil mardud, it's a rejected ta'wil. So now in North America, because you have a lot of arrogance, American culture breeds arrogance, a lot of com competition. And then you couple that with the sense of nostalgia that America tends to amplify ideas of race, gender. Now we see even things like sexual orientation. People are now supplementing the correct interpretive mechanisms with nostalgia or romanticized history, trying to recreate an imagined perfect past that they didn't even live in. Like, how do you know it was perfect if you didn't live there? And nostalgia can only last so long. And actually relying on nostalgia as a, as a intellectual means of interpretation is really the sign of a defeated community in many ways. I'm not talking about now the prophetic era and the Salaf. I'm talking about the recent history. So Imam Asubki uh, uh, in Jama'a Jawami, 
It's a very important book in the sort of fiqh. He talks about chapter on ta'weed. Mm. And Imam Abu uh, Al Hamid in another book he said, Ya'rifu ma yaqbaru ta'wili wa ma la yaqbaru ta'wili laysa bi hayyin. Imam Al Ghazari in Al Mustasfa in Usul al Fiqh he says, Knowing what accepts interpretation and what doesn't accept interpretation is very difficult. So inshallah, in the future, we plan to have a class on this that I teach in Usul al-Fiqh. What are the problematic approaches that American Muslims have taken to understanding and implementing religious text, or in some cases, disregarding religious text. In comparison to what Islamic legal philosophy teaches us are the parameters of a ta'wil. A ta'wil. So Sayyidina Imam Asyuti, uh, Imam Asubki, he says, At-ta'wilu huwa hamlu al-muhtamil li dalilin fa'in kana li dalilin fa sahih. He said that interpretation happens, and I'm going to summarize, when we have a proper evidence for interpretation. For example, in the, in the sixth verse of the fifth chapter of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you, when you intend to, when you stand to pray, then wash your face. Nobody can interpret that verse that way. Nobody can interpret it that way. So what does it mean? When you intend, so this is ta'wil. You don't stick to the literal meaning. You go for the implicit meaning with evidence. That's called ta'wil. فسيدنا إمام السبكي تاج الدين السبكي إن جمع جوامع says هو حمل المحتمل هو حمل الظاهر على المحتمل which means that you take the implicit text because there is a legitimate reason to do so فإن كان لي دليل فصحيح if it's based on the evidence it's sound أو يظن ما فيه دليل ففاسد or maybe you assume there's a reason to interpret and he said if that is the case if that is the case then it is rejected then it is rejected and that's the case of many people there is an imagination that is encouraging them to interpret and this is shaitanic because it can be rooted in the nafs and Allah SWT says, Wara ahwa'ahum. Don't follow your hawa. So he says, Aw yadhunnu ma fihi al-muhtamil awa ta'weel fafasidun. In that situation, it's corrupted. And then he says, Aw la li shay'in fala'abun laysa ta'weel. Or someone just says, one of, they don't have any evidence for what they're doing. He said, if and that's the case, then they're just playing around with the religion, and this is not interpretation. In the future, inshallah, especially on Wednesday nights, I'm going to walk you through this a little bit more because ta'wil al nusus, interpreting the text, is something very important for American Muslims if our hope is not political and social utility, but our hope is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But one of the goals of shaitan is to make people make interpretation when there's no need for interpretation or to make an interpretation which is rooted in the nafs or to deceive people into thinking they can achieve something through certain types of interpretation. And as Sayyidina Imam al-Subki rahimahullah, he said, فَلَعِبٌ لَا تَأْوِيلٌ he says, Thumma'lam, Sayyidina Imam Abu Hamad, Thumma'lam, Ba'da hadha taqseem, Anna al-khatir al-ladhi min qibari Allahi ta'ala, Ibtida'a qad yakunu bi khabri, Khabrin, bi khayrin, Ikraman, wa ilzaman al-hujjah, Wa qad yakunu bi sharrin, Imtihanan wa taghlidhan lil-mihna. This is what we stopped last week, when people maybe say like, I make dhikr, I make dua, and I still have these shaitanic thoughts, and these shaitanic ideas, why is this happening? So Imam Abu Hamid rahimahullah, locates the, the, the essence of believing in Qada and Qadr. 
And he says, therefore, you have to know now, after we talked about the khawatir, the different types of thoughts that we have, that sometimes this may come from, this will come from Allah directly to you. And that's related to good things, as we talked about before. Ikraman wa ilzaman al hujjah as a sense of honor and then to establish you on proof. To give you like motivation. And sometimes Allah will decree that we are tested in our thoughts and our ideas and doubts and, and desires and other things as a test, imtihana, a test for us. And to show us this, this is a test. And that, of course, whenever you, and we talked about this last time, whenever we, we have the mulhim, the one that gives, gives us ilham. And we have a very important principle in sharia, that ilham, inspiration, is subjected to the sharia. الشريعه تستغني عن الالهام والالهام لا يستغني عن الشريعه we say that sharia doesn't need ilham whatever allah has said خلاص whatever the prophet has said خلاص الحلال بين والحرام بين the halal is clear the haram is clear خلاص but to to feel inspired towards something good there is a very very important set of principles in islamic legal thought that govern these kind of inspirational thoughts because sometimes we find people abusing others and mistreating others and claiming it was ilham or people disobeying Allah and claiming it was ilham that's impossible why because the mulhim is an angel and as we learned in aqidah angels do not disobey Allah so therefore, it is impossible for the one that has been given the task of providing me with ilham to yulhim ni bi shar. Because angels do not disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, the inspiration that's coming from this angel can only be in good. And what does it mean by good? That it is sharia compliant. I remember there was a, a man years ago who told me that a sheikh told him to give him his house. The sheikh claimed to be Sufi. He said, give me your home. And so the brother told him, I can't give you my home. And then the sheikh, he threatened to curse him and, you know, that the, 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 the scourges of hell would befall this individual. And then he said to him, you know, this is ilham that you must give me your house. That's not ilham, that's hawa. The prophets in the Quran, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا We don't ask you for anything. So the shaykh, he says, Abu Hamid, we need to remember this. Any time, just remember this principle, any Muslim, teacher or otherwise, is trying to use the unseen, the supernatural, if you will, to motivate you. If those claims violate the Sharia, then these people are up to no good. Either they're negligent, they're ignorant, or they are purposely engaged in something problematic. And you should run. Then Abu Hamdi says, وَالْخَاتِرُ الَّذِي يَكُونُ مِنْ قِبَلِ الْمُلْهِمِ لَا يَكُونُ إِلَّا بِخَيْرٍ That those thoughts that come from the mulhim, the one that gives you ilham, can only be good. And what does he mean by khair? Sharia compliant. The second important thing that we have to realize when people are claiming, especially religious sometimes teachers, and we find sometimes people, and I put it in quotes, who claim to be Sufi, they manipulate their followers by saying that they know something about them that's, you know, the, even the follower doesn't know about themselves. There's some kind of unseen measurement. 
that the sheikh or the teacher, the murshid, this is nonsense. This has nothing to do with Sunni Sufism. This is Sufism that's gone wild. So, so the person says to you, you know, I know something about you that's from the unseen. And that's the second principle. That no one can ever definitively claim a ruling based on ilham. Because we're not prophets. It has to, again, abide by the rules and regulations of Sharia. The third is that ilham can never be used as an excuse to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La. Inna Allah la ya'muru bil fahsha atakuluna ala Allahi ma la ta'lamu. Quran says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't command except towards what's good. So this is very, very important. And I want you to remember this now. لَا يَكُونُ إِلَىٰ بِخَيْرٍ إِذْ هُوَ نَاصِحٌ مُرْشِدٌ لَمْ يُرْسَلُ إِلَّا لِذَارِكِ Imam Abu Hamid says that ilham can only be good, Sharia compliant, because the mulhim has only been sent by God as a sincere advisor to good, and that's it. The second, وَالْخَاتِرُ الَّذِي يَكُونُ مِنْ قِبْرِ الشَّيْطَانِ لَا يَكُونُ إِلَّا بِشَرٍ إِغْوَاءً وَاسْتَنْزِيلًا وَرُبَّمَا يَكُونُ بِالْخَيْرِ مَكْرًا وَاسْتِدْرَاجًا He says that in inspirations from shaitan are largely going to be related to disobeying, to being non-sharia compliant. But there are times when shaitan will encourage someone to do good as a strategy, knowing that that good may cause that person to fall into greater evil. And how do we protect ourselves from that? We have a strong supporting caste, whether it's our spouses, our religious teachers, our community, our friends. We need to bounce ideas off people. I can give an example. There was a good friend of mine some years ago who has a really nice position taking care of a wonderful family. And suddenly he wanted, at, I, I think in his 50s, he wanted to leave America and move to the desert and take his children. So he could like, you know, so that individual, he wanted to move in the middle of nowhere, leave his job, settle with his family, um, you know, which seemed to be a good thing for him, right? To go study, memorize the Quran and so on and so forth. And so he, he contacted me. And, and, and I said to him, this is ridiculous. This is a ridiculous um, idea. Um, I, I, I strongly dis, you know, discourage you from it. And he was like, are you telling me not to study the deen? I said, no, I'm telling you not to destroy your family. So that's an example of someone that shaitan may be trying to trick into doing good. And it seems good, but it's not good. Another example is maybe shaitan encourages you to stay up late at night to do something that's seemingly good and you miss Fajr. Or someone in the name of religion or religious actions is going to neglect their family, their main responsibilities. So uh, Imam Abu Hamad says, وَرُبَّمَا يَكُونُ بِالْخَيْرِ مَكْرًا وَاسْتِدْرَاجًا and, and you know, this could be a trick or a trap. So a person needs to be aware, what is ultimately the most important thing I can be doing at this time in my life? And when I make a decision, how is it going to reverberate the people around me? وَلَقَدْ وَجَدْتُ عَنْ بَعْدِ السَّرَفِ أَنَّ هَوَى النَّفْسِ أَيْدًا قَدْ يَكُونُ يَدْعُوا عَفْوًا قَدْ يَدْعُوا إِلَى الْخَيْرِ إِلَى خَيْرٍ وَمَقْصُورُ مِنْهُ شَرٌ كَالشَّيْطَانِ فَهَذِهِ أَنْوَاعُهَا He says, finally, the nafs 
are largely only going to call you to evil, to prohibit you from good and to make things difficult for you. And that some of the early Salaf have said, some of the early Muslims said that, you know, uh, one of the tricks of shaitan is to, uh, the nafs, excuse me, is also at times to get someone to good as a strategy to take them away from a greater good. Then he said, ثُمَّ بَعْدَ هَذَا أَنَّكَ مُحْتَاجٌ إِلَى مَعْرِفَةِ ثَلَاثَةِ فُصُورٍ لَا بُدَّ لَكَ مِنْهَا الْبَتَى وَفِيهَا الْمَقْصُودِ He said, then you, you have to know, and this, we're going to stop today, forgive me, I don't have a lot of energy. Uh, as many of you know, went through interesting, uh, interesting experience. Alhamdulillah. He said, you have to know three things. And these three things are very important to protect you in all this. أَحَدُهَا الْفَرْقُ بَيْنَ الْخَاتِرِ الْخَيْرِ وَخَاتِرِ الشَّرِّ فِي الْجُمْلَةِ that generally you need to know the differences between good thoughts and bad thoughts, as we outlined earlier. Then when it comes to bad thoughts, you need to be able to differentiate between what is something from shaitan and what is something from your nafs. People in Ramadan sometimes, why am I still having bad thoughts? There's no shaitan. And then how do you differentiate between them? Because each of them has its own more or less remedy. And then you need to be aware of what's from Allah, what's from shaitan, what's from your nafs, so you can follow the right inspirations. You can distance yourself from bad thoughts, whether related to shaitan or your nafs. He says, فَأَمَّا الْفَصْلُ الْأَوَّلُ As for the earth, the first, excuse me, فَقَالَ عُلَمَاؤُنَا رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ Our scholars, theologians have said, إِذَا أَرَدْتَ أَنْ تَعْلَمْ خَاطِرَ الْخَيْرِ مِنْ خَاطِرِ الشَّرْ If you want to know the difference between good ideas, in bad ideas, Actually, He said, if you want to differentiate between our mawazin, afan al arba'a, He said, if you want to know the differences between the thoughts you have, whether they're good or bad, then you should measure them with four things. الأول أن تعليل الأمر الذي خطر ببارك على الشرع. As we said earlier, the first is any ideas or thoughts you have subjugated to the Sharia. فإن وافق جنس سهو فهو خير. And if it agrees with the Sharia, then it's good. Although still, it's not always necessarily going to be the best thing. Just because something's permissible doesn't mean it's wise. So I would also add to that with shura, talking with your family, talking with the people who these decisions impact. When kana bi dihi bi ruqsatin aw shubhatin fa huwa shar. And if it is something that is not sharia compliant, and he uses the word ruqsa here, if you understand it to mean something different, but if it's something doubtful or problematic, stay away from it, it's evil. Fa illam yastabil laka bi al mizan and if you still find yourself confused, then look at the example of the righteous. And if you see the righteous people doing that, you should follow them. And if you see, you know, the knowledgeable people avoiding it, then you yourself should stay away from it. Then if you can't, that doesn't provide any solution for you, then you have to look to yourself. And if, if it is something for which the nafs find repugnant, meaning your, your good nafs, not out of like fear of consequence or something happening to you, then it's good. 
sorry, if it's something that the, the nafs flee from, and they flee from it out of a sense of responsibility, not out of like, what are people going to say or this or that, but you, you, you feel this is a very serious, like the nafs, the nafs don't want it. Not out of fear of Allah, not of fear of good, out of fear of people, the nafs are, fl are, are fleeing from it, then you know that it's good actually. Because the nafs, their, its nature, excuse me, I, I read it wrong. The nature is to lean towards like ease. So if something's presented to the nafs and the nafs runs away from it because it senses responsibility, it usually means that thing is good. Inshallah, you have to forgive me. I don't have a lot of energy till now, alhamdulillah. So we're going to stop here. And tomorrow we have our uh, continued uh, lesson, inshallah, on uh, gun control. Barakallahu uh, feekum. If there's any questions, I'm going to review this again also next week. I'm still a little out of it, alhamdulillah. Um, next week we'll be meeting hopefully in person, inshallah, and picking it up from there. بارك الله فيكم وجزاكم الله خيرا صلى الله وسلم على سيد محمد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. If you like to listen to more, please donate to www.icnyu.org/donate. For more of our virtual programs, go to www.icnyu.org/classes. If you have any questions, email us at info@icnyu.org. At